Good morning, Wabash. Today, speaking at Pioneer Chapel, will be Dr. Todd McDorman with his talk entitled Sports and Life. Dr. Todd McDorman is a professor of rhetoric and acting dean of the college currently. Dr. McDorman's primary research involves the rhetoric of sport with a focus on the image repair efforts of banished baseball icon Pete Rose. Dr. McDorman, his wife Kelly, and their two children live close to campus and enjoy attending college and community events. Dr. McDorman is a fan of the Cincinnati Reds, a rec re recreational runner who participates in half marathons and has a particular affinity for Harry Potter. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McDorman. Good morning, Wabash. Thank you to the Sinks Club for the invitation to speak with you this morning. I have uh, what I think is a relatively simple message today about sports and life and how in its best and most uplifting forms, sports can provide instruction and inspiration to us. In my case, I am interested in how some examples from the world of sports might encourage us to think about how we interact with, treat, and think about others. My message reflects that I like sports. I like the stories, the sense of community, and the history. I like that it's a test of wills, a test of bodies, and a test of minds. I like that beyond the box score, it contains a drama, one that is often reflected and challenged society. I like that it's about successes and victories, but that some of its most important lessons are in tragedy and defeat. Of course, there are also a number of things that I don't like about sports. There are attitudes of entitlement. There is poor behavior by players and fans. Sports are overly commercial and economically outsized, as are the egos of many who participate in them. And unfortunately, for as many good and endearing lessons one can learn through sports, lessons about teamwork, hard work, and leadership, there are an equal number of alarming possibilities involving turning opponents into enemies, the objectification of the other, and instances of gender violence. I spent a fair amount of time studying sports since I arrived at Wabash, including in my scholarship and offering a number of regular and independent study courses. Those courses in my scholarship addressed both the more uplifting and more problematic aspects of sport. So while I'm not so naive as to overlook the more negative or damaging aspects of sport, for the most part, I've put those aside today in favor of sharing three sports stories that are also life stories, stories you may or may not already be familiar with that I think speak to how we might better treat others in a sense of decency that we would benefit from more often emulating. Sorry fans of soccer and Quidditch, but I have drawn my examples from the three most prominent North American sports, baseball, basketball, and football. On June 2nd, 2010, Armando Galarraga, a relatively unknown pitcher from Venezuela who pitched for the Detroit Tigers and was in his third major league season, nearly became the 21st pitcher to throw a perfect game. However, veteran umpire Jim Joyce ruled that Cleveland's Jason Donald, the 27th and would-be final batter for the Indians, safely reached first base ahead of a throw from Miguel Cabrera to Galarraga, who was covering on a ground ball. And while replays confirmed what Tigers on the field instantly thought, the runner was out. Joyce had made a mistake. This was before baseball had expanded instant replay. In response to the missed call, Galarraga offered a slight smile and a shrug, but did not protest the call. Instead, he went back to the pitching mound and completed a one-hit shutout victory. At the conclusion of the game, the Tigers manager and several players charged at Joyce as he attempted to leave the field. The public, too, soon began scapegoating Joyce. After the television broadcast reported that Joyce grew up in Toledo, a different Jim Joyce still living in that town, reported receiving more than 40 angry calls. He conveyed the experience to a journalist saying, everybody was pretty irate. 
A lot of them said vulgar things. After what someone posted the non-umpire Joyce's telephone number and address to Facebook, he disconnected his telephone service. The umpire Jim Joyce had his Wikipedia entry vandalized, saw the creation of both a Facebook forum and a website called Fire Jim Joyce, and he and his family received death threats. Many initial journalistic reactions to the situation were equally unkind as they sought to vilify and scapegoat the umpire for having blown, robbed, or ruined a perfect game due to his egregious, preposterously wrong, and hideously incorrect call. One prominent journalist in the New York Times wrote that Joyce had robbed Galarraga of a perfect game with a call a Little League umpire wouldn't have missed. At least six journalistic accounts called it the worst call in baseball history. A number of sports writers and politicians wanted the call to be overturned and the perfect game restored, with Michigan's governor going so far as to issue a proclama proclamation stating that Armando Galarraga had indeed pitched a perfect game. Initially lost in the furor was the value of the reactions of the umpire and the, and the pitcher. Reactions that showed decency, kindness, grace, and forgiveness. Shortly after the game concluded, Jim Joyce watched the replay and confirmed that he was mistaken on the safe call of Donald. Rather than defending his call, blaming his mistake on some other factor, or quickly exiting the stadium, Joyce accepted responsibility. In speaking with reporters, he explained he had kicked the call, and he emotionally admitted, I just cost that kid a perfect game. Just as Galarraga would soon absolve him, Joyce excused the Tigers for their reaction, saying, I don't blame them a bit for what was said. While adding about Galarraga, I would have been the first person in my face, and he didn't say a word to me. Joyce also sought out Galarraga to apologize. According to Galarraga, Joyce hugged me right away, not even one word, before saying, I'm sorry, and beginning to cry. In turn, rather than criticize Joyce, Galarraga expressed compassion and understanding for Joyce's mistake. He told reporters, nobody's perfect, everyone's human. I give him a lot of credit for saying, I need to talk to you, and really saying, I'm sorry. Galarraga expressed further sympathy and compassion for Joyce when he said he feels really bad, and he absolved Joyce of guilt and offered forgiveness by saying, I don't have any problem with him in my heart. In an age when we often react with anger and vitriol, and too often do so in digital forms, I find this to be a powerful story. Armando Galarraga had just lost a historic moment in what would turn out to be a relatively brief and otherwise obscure major league career. However, Joyce's contrition and Galarraga's charitable view and act of forgiveness make the game entirely unique. And it's likely for that reason that the first base bag from the fateful game remains on display at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. The reactions of the key participants demonstrate we don't have to be perfect that contrition and forgiveness can be cathartic, and there is much to be learned and gained from being charitable and viewing others as mistaken rather than vicious. My second story is the one you are most likely to be familiar with. It involves Steph Curry, a wonderful basketball talent who's a two-time NBA MVP and a three-time world champion. It doesn't hurt that he's from Davidson College a nationally ranked liberal arts college of fewer than 2,000 students. It might be noted that Curry attended Davidson for only three years before leaving for the NBA, and despite his fame, he hasn't had his jersey retired. That is because, according to a school policy to which Curry doesn't object to, one has to have completed their degree to have a retirement ceremony. To his credit, Curry says, I knew what I signed up for when I went to Davidson. I made a promise that when I left school, I would finish. I think that it is commendable and shows character on the part of both Davidson and Curry, but that isn't the story I want to tell. Like many basketball players, Curry has his own undoubtedly overpriced basketball shoe. 
In November of 2018, nine-year-old Riley Morrison, whose bedroom decorations demonstrate her unmistakable devotion to Curry and the Golden State Warriors, wrote to Curry to explain that she couldn't find his shoe in the girls section of the Under Armour website or sized for girls. In a handwritten letter, Morrison wrote, I know you support girl athletes because you have two daughters and you host an all girls basketball camp. I hope you can work with Under Armour to change this because girls want to rock the Curry Fives too. <laughs> Almost immediately, Curry responded with his own handwritten note, thanking Riley for her message and saying he had spent the last two days talking to Under Armour about how we can fix the issue so you can wear my kicks proudly. As one industry analyst explained the situation, the basketball shoe industry has gotten away with selling women men's shoes over the years, and it's certainly more efficient and less expensive to do it that way. However, beyond the simple placement and size adjustment for the Curry 5, the subsequent Curry 6 was designed specifically for female athletes. Curry invited Riley Morrison to a game at which he met her and had her help design the sock liner for the new shoe, a liner that features two females playing basketball and includes phrases like girls hoop to, be the change, and girl power. It appears that the shoe makes Curry the first marquee male athlete to be the face of a basketball shoe specifically designed for females. Now, I'm not oblivious that this can be critiqued as a calculatedly capitalist endeavor and it can be questioned for displacing or overshadowing the visibility of remarkable female athletes. But I'm more moved by Curry's act of responding to Morrison, that he admitted something should be done and that he made an effort to do so. Maybe he was thinking about his two daughters and the world that they are growing up in. Regardless, it is an act of responsibility and decency that prioritizes responding to the exclusion of females as athletes rather than concerns about market size that might make production inefficient. It is also a good lesson not just for Riley, but for all of us. As the nine-year-old explained in a television interview that the experience had showed her, just by writing a letter, you can change the world. And you don't have to be rude. You can be kind and respectful and still change it. My final story involves Wabash football, and in the interest of full disclosure, I previously told a variation of the story from this very spot, though the most senior students here were probably in kindergarten at the time. And apart from that, it is probably a story that only a few, like Professor Emeritus of Chemistry David Phillips or college archivist Beth Swift, are familiar with. It is the story of Samuel S. Gordon and the 1903 Wabash College football team. The slow integration of professional athletics is often simplified to the courageous accomplishments of Jackie Robinson when he became the first black professional baseball player in 1947. Of course, the story is more complicated than that and contains many dimensions, including 44 years prior when Wabash took what was then a socially courageous stand on the football field. The 1903 Wabash squad featured 24-year-old African-American Samuel S. Gordon of West Virginia. As you might imagine, football was a bit different in 1903 than it is today. Both the players and the rosters were considerably smaller. Players typically played multiple positions and played both offense and defense. Touchdowns counted for five points, and the forward pass was not yet legal. Late in Wabash's season opening game, the left tackle was injured and Gordon entered as a substitute. The opposition captain demanded Gordon's removal and threatened to forfeit, which is exactly what happened when Wabash's coach, Tug Wilson, refused to remove Gordon from the game. The following week, an emotional chapel was held in which Wabash stated its loyalty to Gordon and its resolve that he remained part of the team. The chapel was reported in the Crawfordsville Journal of September 24, 1903. Coach Wilson relayed to his audience that Gordon was appreciative of the support of his teammates and that if allowed to play, he would do all in his powers to help them win. 
It is said that after Coach Wilson's remarks that the rafters of the chapel shook with the roars of applause and the cheers that rang out. Subsequently, on September 26, 1903, Wabash beat Indiana University 5-0. High-scoring game. Uh, with Gordon playing at right guard. While Gordon played the next two games without incident, including an 18 to nothing loss to Purdue, Rose Polly said that the October 10th contest would be canceled if Gordon was to play. As the Wabash team considered its options, Gordon encouraged them to play without him. Then, during that evening's scrimmage, Gordon was injured, leaving him unable to play regardless. But this is when President Kane heard of the situation. He declared that unless it was agreed that Gordon was eligible to play, the game would not occur. The message was wired to Rose, uh, Rose Polly. They refused, and the game was canceled. Due to continuing controversy, Gordon resigned from the team for three games before returning for the November 14th victory over Earlham, in which he entered as a substitute. This led up to the November 21st, 1903 game versus DePauw. Gordon was in uniform, and it is reported that when DePauw saw him, that they refused to come out of the locker room. General Lou Wallace and others appealed to DePauw as they were preparing to leave. And according to the New York Times from the following day, Wallace besought the young man not to disgrace a Christian college by drawing the color line and protested against what he denounced as cowardice and barbarism. Another source reports that Wallace gave the DePauw team, students, faculty, administrators, and trustee, trustees a lecture on bigotry well laced with a sort of hellfire and damnation of which he was a master. DePaul eventually agreed to play, and they were defeated by Wabash 10 to nothing, although Gordon did not enter the game. The following year, W.M. Cantrell, another African American, was on the Wabash roster, and the game with DePaul was canceled when DePauw's president said that he feared strained relations between the students and the two institutions if Cantrell was allowed to play. With the exception of the cancellation of the remainder of the 1910 season after the death of Ralph Lee Wilson, 1904 is the most recent year without a game between the two rivals. In 1905, when Wabash was again without an African-American player, DePaul returned to the schedule and Wabash won 52 to nothing. Gordon played the final two games, or the final game of the 1903 season without incident, a loss to a Notre Dame team that wasn't scored upon all year. In all, the team won nine games and lost three, but one might say that the greatest victory was the team and the college's position on Gordon. It was a stance that prioritized decency and dignity over playing the game. We live in complicated, complex times. Let's face it, there is much in the world to be concerned about. In responding, we have frequently been conditioned to put ourselves as individuals first, to displace our responsibility for situations and our responsibility to others, and to aggressively express our displeasure for not getting what we want or think we deserve. Sports is often symptomatic of these challenges, if not itself part of the problem. But within sports, we can also find uplifting stories that might serve as examples for life. The umpire Jim Joyce teaches us about taking responsibility for our actions and the value of being willing to acknowledge and recognize when we are mistaken. The near-perfect pitcher Armando Galarraga reminds us of the value of charity, grace and forgiveness and responding to the mistakes and imperfections of others. In responding to Riley Morrison, Steph Curry conveyed a sense of integrity while advocating inclusion. And Riley Morrison herself is a powerful example of how we can question convention and productively participate in positive change. Finally, the story of Wabash College and Samuel Gordon speaks to how sports can often be at the frontier of social change and promoting equality and dignity for all. In all three instances, I'm struck about lessons from sport and how we might interact with, treat, and think about others. It is a reflection of our shared commitment to something greater than ourselves, 
the personification of the gentleman's rule and the mission of the college. And it's a consideration of how we can be our better selves in a manner that is never finished and is constantly tested. To call upon a variation of one of our favorite mantras, it isn't always easy, but it will be worth it. Thank you.